So I read the report and everything, but could you um, give us just like a brief summary of what it's all about? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think the, the biggest takeaway is that the energy infrastructure proposals um, that we analyzed from President Biden and from Senator Manchin would be a darn good deal for, for West Virginia. Um, it would enable us to achieve nearly 80% emission-free power generation uh, by 2030. Uh, and in the process, it would enable us to create roughly 3,500 jobs and reduce our energy costs by uh, almost a billion dollars, $855 million through, through 2040. Yeah. So can we quantify those numbers a little bit more for people who might not understand sort of what those numbers mean? Like, where are we right now compared to how we would be um, if this was passed? Absolutely. So what we did is we, we analyzed two scenarios. One is essentially our current trajectory. Um, so that it's not complete status quo. We do take into account the fact that our utilities today are trying to build out renewable energy. Um, so we, we project out that current trajectory and then we compare that against uh, a trajectory for power resources that would be enabled by the proposals from President Biden, Biden and Senator Manchin. Um, under the current trajectory, we would still be looking at a uh, significant dependence on coal-fired power generation through 2030, through 2040. Um, we're talking about 70-some uh, percent coal-fired power generation even through 2040. And then in contrast with the scenario we modeled looking at the potential build-out of uh, emission-free power resources enabled by uh, these energy infrastructure proposals, you'd be looking at 80% uh, uh, emission-free power generation uh, just after 2030, specifically 79.4% in 20, 2030, and then increasing thereafter. And then in terms of the, the jobs, um, I think it's important to note that we looked at this as a, a full upstream downstream analysis. Um, so this isn't saying just that 3,500 jobs would be created. This is, this is looking on a net basis. So taking into account all the changes uh, throughout the economy that, that this could um, bring about, you would still be looking at net job creation of 3,500 full-time jobs. I think it's also important to note that this has a, uh, a durational element to it. This isn't just, oh, 3,500 jobs are created in 2024, but they go away in 2025. This takes into account the entire study period of 2021 through 2040 and says that 3,500 jobs would be created throughout that, that period. Wow, yeah. So um, these jobs in terms of the quality is probably what the average person is going to wanna to know. Are these good jobs that would be created? So I think the, the most straightforward uh, metric from our, for our modeling that could kind of stand in for that is the fact that we would not only be looking at net job creation, but also net increase in uh, incomes. Um, so it's not just the fact that you're ending up with a, a greater amount of jobs, but you're ending up with a, a greater amount of income for West Virginians. Um, so we don't want to get into the precise detail of for, for any given job, the exact uh, salary for it, um, but just looking at it uh, from a big picture perspective, we'd be looking at increased earnings uh, throughout the state under this scenario. I can anticipate that maybe some of our viewers might um, wonder a little bit about sort of like expanding natural gas, which was a little bit part of the plan and wonder why we aren't just um, trying to focus on only renewables. Um, yep. You have like any sort of answer for that? Um, so what we try to do is try to come up with the most cost-effective way to hit the clean energy goals that are in the, the plan from the president, um, specifically trying to get to 80% uh, uh, emission-free power generation by, by 2030 and getting on a pathway to 100% by, by 2035. And what we found is we can deploy wind and solar today in a very cost-effective way. Um, but we also think that to get to 100%, it's possible we're going to need some other technologies. Um, and so there, there's also been an emphasis from our policymakers to make sure we're investing in innovation and having the natural gas in the portfolio is an opportunity to do that because it allows for the possibility of down the row, down the road, 
converting those facilities to either carbon capture uh, and storage natural gas facilities or hydrogen fired facilities. Um, so specifically, we, we talked about uh, constructing two combined cycle natural gas units in West Virginia. And those are the type of, of units that experts say that we could down the road convert to uh, hydrogen firing in a way that's, that's economical. Now, we don't know today whether that's going to be the, the case or not. We don't know whether it's going to be hydrogen. We don't know whether it's going to be carbon capture. We don't know if, in fact, wind and solar will just continue to get cheaper. Battery storage will continue to get cheaper, and maybe those resources will make more sense. But it leaves the door open for that, and it also allows us to take advantage of our, our very affordable natural gas resources today in, in the meantime while we pursue that future. Mm -hmm. Um, and you guys' opinion, how likely do you think it is that these plans will pass? I'd, I'd say there's a decent chance. I think what um, a lot of folks are recognizing is that um, there's an opportunity to make a deal here. Um, you have a lot of folks that are saying we absolutely need to get to 80% uh, emission-free power generation, generation by 2030. But they're also recognizing uh, that we have a lot of communities, especially in West Virginia, that have made a lot of sacrifices and contributions through the fossil fuel economy to power America's economic rise uh, throughout the 20th century and 21st century. And we need to make sure that uh, West Virginia and other communities like ours play a role in, in this uh, evolving energy economy. So let's make sure we're making a major reinvestment into those communities. So it sets up this opportunity for a deal where, um, you know, the, the utilities in West Virginia, they're already planning to retire their coal-fired power plants. Um, First Energy is looking to retire their plants by 2050 or earlier. The, the scheduled retirement dates for uh, the Appalachian Power and Wheeling Power uh, coal-fired power plants are 2040. Um, so they're already planning to retire these. This is an opportunity to maybe move a little bit faster than we were planning but also receive a really major reinvestment in our coal communities and our energy economy. Mm -hmm. um, so I know in some of the stories that I've done before, like even before Biden um, took office, a lot of people were excited for this year because, you know, Manchin has a bigger role, I guess, in the sort of um, environmental aspect of things and stuff like that. Uh, have we seen sort of like, um, I guess hope that like not only can we sort of like get into this just transition but also sort of have it be West Virginia centric in the sense that we won't get left behind? No question. Uh, I think we're extremely fortunate uh, for Senator Manchin to be to be in the position he is to, to really be shaping what this evolving energy economy is going to look like and to make sure that West Virginia has a, a robust role in that. So there's no question um, the, the recent bipartisan infrastructure legislation that was passed in the Senate, um, that, that included a lot of proposals from Senator Manchin, including um, part of what we modeled in our analysis, which is a major investment in energy manufacturing. Um, a, a portion of that ended up being included in the, the bipartisan legislation and a further expansion of that is being considered in the, the budget reconciliation plan that is still being considered. I also think it's worth noting that um, while, while we're very fortunate to have Senator Manchin in this position, we're also fortunate that Senator Capito is in the, the position she is on the environmental uh, committee in the Senate. And she also has made uh, uh, played a significant role in making sure that there are a lot of investments in West Virginia through this bipartisan push for energy infrastructure. Why is um, a swift transition so important for this sort of well, thing? Well, I, th I think you can kind of take two views on this. Um, my personal view is that it's important to do uh, from, a, from a climate perspective, because it seems like just about every scientist in the world agrees now that if we don't do this, then these, these major flood events, these winter storms, uh, uh, these hurricanes, all these things that are uh, affecting our region, they're only gonna get more and more devastating as time goes by. So my personal view is that we need to do it for that reason. Um, but then let's say that you don't quite subscribe to that. 
there's also the economic considerations. The reality is that the private sector has already committed to get into zero emission power generation by, by 2050, if not sooner. Uh, we're talking about not only major employers in West Virginia, like, like Walmart and P&G and Toyota, but also our utilities and also the, the investors in our economy that decide where money is going to flow and where new investments are going to be coming in. So regardless of, of you know, the extent to which you might be in, uh, following and subscribing to the, the scientific view on this, there's also just the economic view that we need to make sure that West Virginia has a robust role in this evolving energy economy. So you, you might uh, occasionally just want to set your personal views aside and figure out what sort of uh, economy do we want the state to have in the future and what, what sort of a economy do we want our, our children to have a chance to play a role in in the future.